and written on this subject in both the Old and the New Testament. God's church is described as a woman. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 3, Paul, the Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and this is what he said. He said in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 3, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He's talking to the church. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So in Bible prophecy, a woman represents a church. Now, in Revelation 12, we have a pure woman, God's church, and she is pregnant. She is about to bear a child. And some people wonder what this means. They, all they can think about is the Virgin Mary. But it's not talking about the Virgin Mary. It's talking about God's church. What, do, what does it mean for God's church to be pregnant and to bring forth a child? Let's just see what the Apostle Paul said about it. The Apostle Paul understood this subject thoroughly, and he wrote about it on a number of occasions. Look at Galatians, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> Galatians, the fourth chapter, and verse 19. He's writing to a church that was converted, but they went into apostasy. And now he's making an appeal to them. Notice what he says, Galatians 4, 19. He says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again, until what? Until Christ is formed in you. What was he talking about? Was he talking about the flesh? Absolutely not. He's talking to men as well as women, and men don't have babies in the flesh. But he's t talking to the church, and he says, I'm laboring and travailing again until Christ is born or is formed in you. What's he talking about? He's talking about the spiritual nature of Christ, the spiritual character of Christ. In fact, you remember the first text we read was in Ephesians 3, 8 to 10, where it talked about this mystery this great mystery of God that's going to be revealed through the church. Do you know what the mystery is? The mystery is Christ formed in you. His character being formed in you so that you think like he thinks and you talk like he talks and you act like he acts. That's what the mystery is. Let's read that. Look in uh, Colossians 1. Colossians 1. He talks about this same subject again, Colossians 1, verse 27. He says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you. There you have it. What is this great mystery that has been hidden in the mind of God and he wants to reveal it through the church to the whole universe? It's Christ in you. That's what the Apostle Paul says it is. And I want to tell you something. If you want to be a member of this church that's talked about in Revelation 12, you must bring forth the spiritual character of Christ in your life. That's what the New Testament religion is all about, friends. The apostles were continually talking about it. Turn back to Revelation, the 12th chapter, and look at the 6th verse. It says here in Revelation 12, 6, it says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Do you know why the woman had to flee in the wilderness? You can't understand that text without understanding who and what the church is. Do you know why the woman had to flee in the wilderness? Because the professed church tried to destroy the real church. It's exactly what happened. And if you don't understand the difference between the real church and the professed church, you cannot understand Revelation 12, 6. 
Let me read something to you from Great Controversy, page 51. Romanists have persisted in bringing against Protestants the charge of heresy and willful separation from the true church, but these accusations apply rather to themselves. They are the ones who laid down the banner of Christ and departed from the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, Jude 3. They're the ones that departed from the faith. Let me explain in a thumbnail sketch exactly what happened. In the church at Rome, there was a departure from the truth, and the time came when the majority of the people in the church and their pastor decided that they were going to worship God on Sunday instead of on Sabbath. Now, I ha have a whole sermon on this. It takes an hour and a half to give it, so obviously we're not going to look at any details of that. It was happening already by the second century. It first started with Easter. They were going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ every year, and then they said, we might as well do it every week. The pagans already had a wild solar holiday on the first day of every week. But there were a few people in the Roman church that wouldn't go along with it. What happens when there's a few people and they don't go along with what the majority of the church wants to do? You ever seen that happen? What happens? Who gets their way, the minority or the majority? Who gets their way? Majority. The majority. And so the majority voted that they were going to worship on Sunday. And there were a few people in that church that wouldn't go along with it. They said, we must keep all the commandments of God. The Bible does not acknowledge a worship like that. Now, you think this through. Can you stay a part of a church when you can't even agree which day to go to church? Can you stay a part of a church like that? You can't do it. You can't do it. So that little group, they had to go somewhere else, down the street, somewhere else, get another pastor, get another building. Now just think what, what would happen sometime later. One of these people that has been forced out because they, don't, they want to keep all of God's commandments. So they've been forced out because the majority of the church and their pastor decided they're going to worship on Sunday. And they meet one of their former brethren on the street in Rome. And this person says to them, why did you leave the church? What, what should they say? They should say, if they understand who the church is, why did you leave the church? You see, the majority of the people had the building, they had the pastor, they had the organization, they had the money, they had everything but the truth. And so the majority of people left the church. Now, they were still in the building, and from a human point of view, it looked like they stayed in. But from God's point of view, the majority that stayed in the building and had the pastor and had everything, they were the ones that left. And the minority, the ones that were forced out, and that it looked like to a human point of view that they had left, they were actually the ones that stayed in the church. <laughs> Reminds me of John 7, 24, Jesus told the Jews, he said, don't judge according to appearance but judge righteous judgment. Righteous judgment is not always according to appearance. So, there was this tremendous controversy then that lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years as who is the church. Now, this would be a whole subject in itself. You could go down and look at what the martyrs said. You could look at what the Waldenses said. And there was this tremendous argument all over Christendom as to who and what the church was. And some people says, this is what it is. And other people said, no, this is what it is. That argument, friends, has persisted clear to the present day. And I'm sorry to tell you that there are many, many Protestants today whose understanding of who and what the church is is more according to Roman Catholic theology than to Protestant theology. Friends, if you're a Protestant, your religion has to come from this book. The difference, let me explain to you in one or two sentences what the difference between a Protestant and a Roman Catholic is. The difference between a Roman Catholic and a Protestant is a Protestant says the Bible is up here and the church is underneath it. The Word of God is above church authority. And a Roman Catholic says, I believe in the, the, the authority of the Bible, but the authority of the church is above the authority of the Bible. And that's the difference. Just this last Sabbath, we had some people that were visiting our church here. We had them home for dinner. And I had, uh, if I knew this before, I had forgotten it. This, this lady that was eating dinner with us 